All right, hello, good morning, everybody. So, um, yeah, we are Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, and um, we're building the Hyperloop. Traveling at the, sound of, uh, at the speed of sound sounds pretty amazing, doesn't it? Well, what's the Hyperloop? Who here actually knows what the Hyperloop really is? I'll test you guys afterwards. Okay. So for all others, we have a little video here that shows how it all started, where we are now, and um, where we're going. So enjoy. America's always been a nation of doers. We build things. We take risks. And we believe that if you have a good idea and are willing to work hard enough, you can turn that idea into a successful business. Billionaire philanthropist Elon Musk has hinted at a new high-speed transport system that could put planes and trains out of business. I have a name for it, name for it, which is called the Hyperloop. So what's Hyperloop? Mr. Musk's plan? Move people using a massive vacuum tube combined with a magnetic levitation system. Kind of like a Jetsons tunnel? It's something like that, yeah. Here's how he teased the idea in May at an All Things D conference. It's a cross between a Concorde and a railgun. It's called the Hyperloop. It's a system of giant suspended tubes. Riding within are capsules carrying people or freight traveling on cushions of air at speeds of up to 1,200 k's per hour, or roughly one kilometer every three seconds. A tube that would be on pillars from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and inside there would be capsule cars that would be rocketed forward up to 700 miles an hour, and that there would be a fan on the front. Elon Musk basically says that this is the way of the future. How do you like something that uh, can never crash? Mm -hmm. um, it is immune to weather. It goes uh, three or four times faster than the, the, the sort of bullet train, and it would cost you uh, much less um, than, than an air ticket. It will only cost to build this six or seven billion dollars. Oh. Compare that to the 65 billion for the current high speed rail plans for California. He believes this is a viable, valuable alternative for mass transit between these two destinations. Could something like the Hyperloop actually be the answer to super fast, environmentally friendly, high speed travel between our busiest cities? So the gauntlet has been thrown down. A design document for a whole new super cool way to travel. The only thing now, will someone pick it up and make the Hyperloop a reality? There are some companies that, have, that are forming to try to make the Hyperloop happen and uh, I encourage them. I think that's, that's great. Um, I'm super focused on Tesla and SpaceX and to, to you know, a small amount on Solar City. so that, that basically completely uses up my, my brain. Tesla founder Elon Musk proposed this new technology called Hyperloop, and it's being developed right now in Playa Vista here in this hangar behind me. The only resistance would be the air in front of the capsule, which uh, we move to the back by using a compressor. Hyperloop has teamed up with the students to create this tube technology that's designed to connect cities up to 400 miles apart. Dirk Alborn says it's safer and more efficient than the railroad. Well, the system is complete, completely computerized. So um, you, know, you optimize the system and then you actually have the humans to monitor it. In railroads, most accidents were all human factors. Plus, a lot of the derailments are actually happened because something's on the track. So we're in a closed system. We're completely managed by a computer system. There's no human factor that can actually create those issues. We actually plan on uh, seeing the first Hyperloop very, very soon starting. Can you imagine uh, and walk us through what it might be like to travel at the speed of sound? It's not going to be much different than uh, sitting in an airplane, actually. Obviously, for us, it's very important to make it as good of an experience as possible. So This is an independent organization that has formed. We have 170 engineers, scientists, and uh, really great professionals with amazing backgrounds. The race is on. Elon Musk's vision for a high-speed passenger pods, known as the Hyperloop, is one step closer to becoming reality this morning. One of the known companies competing to capitalize on Musk's proposal announcing today it has struck a deal with landowners 
headquarters in Central California to build the first full-scale Hyperloop along a five-mile stretch along I-5, with construction set to begin in 2016. Let's bring in Dirk Alburn, who is the man who runs the Hyperloop Transportation Technologies team, which is announcing this deal with Quay Valley, California. Uh, Dirk, tell me about this deal and, and really when you expect this Hyperloop, this five-mile stretch to be finished. Quay Valley is supposed to be breaking ground um, beginning of 2016. That's um, when we will be start um, working on our development. So we will be starting ground uh, at the same time. Uh, we, at this moment, we expect to be done by 2018. Hyperloop now appears one step closer to reality. Starting next year, that theory will turn into a groundbreaking in Quay Valley, Kings County off of I-5. A developer there has just committed a big chunk of his private land toward the project. It's a five-mile loop that would take visitors through a planned entertainment district. There's going to be a test track. Elon Musk has announced that he's going to build a small-scale test track. It's a necessary step for us to be building a full-scale version, and um, Quay Valley is a sustainable model town of the 21st century, so it's a perfect fit. They're expecting over 10 million uh, visitors per year, so we will actually be able to re uh, generate revenues very, very fast. The company plans to go public later this year. We want to do a public offering. We want to give the, uh, our community that's supporting us the possibility to own parts of, uh, of the company. We want to make sure that um, the people that have been helping building um, the company and this technology are able to um, participate in, in, in the investment and in the fundraising and the upside of the company. With their contributions to Hyperloop, these students from around the world now have stock options in the company, but they say they're not in it for the money. As a student, I start to feel like um, I'm in, uh, in part of some great career that might change the world. Will the Hyperloop kill the railroad? The Hyperloop is going to do to the U.S. what the railroads did in the 1800s. So um, it will change the way we live. It's possible today. It's based on existing technologies. And it's the right time. It's the right moment to finally get something doing likes us. Is it visionary? In 30 years' time, <laughs> will you and I be sitting on our rocking chairs going, well, we talked about it then, and he did it. So you think this is possible? This is not just... Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. For all those who said this is just a neat little thing <laughs> to draw on a cocktail napkin, these guys are saying it will become reality. All right. So those were basically two and a half years put together in four or five minutes uh, to give you an overview a little bit. So again, what is a Hyperloop? So imagine a capsule filled with people, okay, traveling inside a tube and going really, really fast from point A to point B. Inside this tube, we create a low-pressure environment. So that the capsule, very similar to an airplane, that goes into high altitudes can revel really fast with very little energy because it has very little resistance. All right, just to, now it works. No, oh, this one works? Okay. So the whole system is completely green, which is one of the most important parts. And um, why is this one of the most important things? Well, you see, when it comes to rail, public transportation, um, there's a big issue, actually. None of the trains, none of the metro systems that are around the world are profitable. They're all relying heavily on government subsidies. So they're all paid by taxpayers. As an example, if you take the metro in Los Angeles, as an example, per passenger the metro makes 76 cents, and taxpayers are paying $2.50 per passenger. So now the Hyperloop is completely green, which means that we're using solar, wind, kinetic energy through regenerative braking, and in some cases even geothermal. 
So we are producing more energy than we're using, which uh, brings our operational costs to a very, very low point. It allows us to be profitable on something like Los Angeles to San Francisco within eight years. And that's something that has never been done before. The system is completely on pylons, which has the advantage that, well, you need to buy less land. Um, it also has advantage that the landowner still can get on the other side, because when you build a normal train or a highway, well, if you as a landowner they actually tell you, you know, figure out how to get on the other side or swap with your neighbors, well, you know, neighbors a lot of times they don't really get along, so that's a little bit an issue. But it also allows us to integrate the latest technology when it comes to earthquakes. We're in California. So the latest building technology can be integrated into a pylon, while when you're right on the ground, um, that's obviously a problem. Capacity is a lot of times something that um, people are asking. And um, well, we are over-engineering, so this is actually a concept, a really early concept in terms of design where we just are able to add on tubes. So remember, we're actually generating revenue. So for us, having capacity issues that's um, something very welcome. So it means we're going to be making even more money. So but why should we do this? This is why. Traffic. And I think all of us know this kind of feeling, right? Um, traffic is, is a very important part of our lives. Based on where we live, we decide where we work. Based on where we live, we decide who we date. Because if she lives on the other side of the city, it might not work out. This is another one. This is Beijing on a nice day. So, you know, we're actually dying earlier because of pollution. So we have to move over to green modes of transportation. Um, Beijing is a city that has almost 50 million people. And um, this is really no joke. This is pretty normal um, in, in, many, in many cities around, um, around Asia, but even in India. So they have problems right now that need to be solved. But even here in Europe and in America, we're dying approximately 14 months earlier because of pollution. So, how are we actually doing this? And um, let's see if I can move over. <laughs> so this is actually the part I'm personally most um, passionate about. I don't know, who, who here is working on a startup company? OK, awesome. Who here is raising capital? All right, so let me tell you how we're doing it. So I'm sure you all know these companies. They all have something in common. They're all failures. Sorry for Blackberry, they still have a chance, but um, for me right now, they're still in there. Then there's these companies. They all have something in common as well. All of these companies at one point in their history were in trouble and moved over into integrating something into their business model that's called crowdsourcing. So in some cases, almost 50% of the innovation is coming from the outside. So Lego, for example, was almost bankrupt. Changed the CEO, the CEO integrated crowdsourcing, and today it's one of the most successful toy companies out there. Still today, the new products of Legos are decided by the community. They're actually giving the ideas. If you give it, get 1,000 votes, then Lego starts looking at it. That's how it works. So we do something that we call crowdstorming. We work with our community, people just like you, everybody. And normally, when it comes to transportation, when it comes to a train, a subway, those things are done behind closed doors. Now, in our case, you can join the team, you know, so you can par be part of what we're doing. Um, or we ask questions, things like, do we need a ticket? And not only do we need a paper ticket, but is a ticket the best way to monetize? And why? Because if we can find a way that we can make more money, the more the passenger rides, well, 
then the ticket becomes actually negative. Then I would use the ticket only to um, regulate demand, right? Just like video games. When I was a kid, we had to pay $60 for a video game. Today, most of them are free. But the video game companies are making way more money than before. So it's about figuring out what's actually your business model. Or things like, what are we going to do with the pylons? Because if I look at our business plan and the costs, well, pylons is a really big part of that. And I'm sure you all have seen the pylons around the city, right? They're, they're everywhere. So you know, it's all about asking the question. You know, if I give you 200 pylons, they're yours. What are you going to do with it? And that's enough. The moment you ask this question, there's going to be some crazy ideas, and some are brilliant. But important is to start thinking about those things. So we have things from, well, let's use them as beehives. How about vertical gardening? Or actually something we are really working on, let's generate water. So there's actually technology that we're working on where we can take humidity out of the air, use the same components that we're using for the Hyperloop, and create distilled water, basically for no extra cost. So it's an income. So it's really all these things where you get more ideas, you question everything, and um, this is a little bit our secret. This is a map that we gave out in one of our CrowdStorm activities. Most people thought that this is a map of the routes, right? And yes, they are. But some of them are the logical ones. Others are there just to give us an idea. We wanted to, we wanted to know what people were thinking, but we didn't tell them. So just because we had Albuquerque, which is next to Las Vegas here, on there, we were three times on TV on Albuquerque. And people were, you know, they, they, they were just um, asking, why Albuquerque? Why would they want to put in Hyperloop into Albuquerque? And we were there looking at all the discussions, taking out the information, validating our assumptions. But what this also shows is what the Hyperloop really is. It's a metro system. It's a metro system that connects cities, but it's also the perfect for inner city transport. Because remember, speed is only one advantage. Cost is a big one. So we started back in 2013. Um, Elon Musk presented the project back in, um, back in August. Um, we presented it, put it on our crowdsourcing platform, and um, our community got crazy. They actually you know, not only voted, hey, you guys should do this, but they said, I want to do this. I want to be part of this. So we incorporated the company, got a small team together, and said everybody who would like to work on this in exchange for stock options with at least 10 hours per week, please apply. We got around 200 applications and um, got a team together of around 100 people and started working on the feasibility study. We finished our feasibility study at the end of 2014. And um, since then, you, can, you hear Hyperloop everywhere. Now there's several other efforts. There's other companies that are there um, trying to do the Hyperloop as well. So why am I telling you this? Well, first of all, if you want to join, I want you to join the right one. But um, I also think it's very interesting to see as a different model. So there's normal companies out there raising now large funds. Um, and there's us. We're a team of over 500 people. 500 people all around the world. We're not building a company. We're building a movement. So everybody who tries to do the Hyperloop as well is actually part of our movement, makes us successful. Right? But I think it's really interesting to see how this works. And in all this process, till today, basically, we haven't raised a cent. The company hasn't raised any funds. Okay, we have self-financed some, but believe me, not a lot. 
this is going to change now, obviously, and uh, we are in the process right now with our team members first and some of the very large funds, but this just shows you that you can do really big things without money. All it takes is people that share your passion. And that's really what I want to give other people. I want to tell you, you know, just don't try to convince necessarily the investor. Try to convince the people that are next to you. And if they say, well, this is awesome what you're doing, then ask them how they can help you. You would be surprised. So we have a community of around 20,000 people that are crowdstorming with us. As I said, over 500 professionals all around the world. And these are not a couple of guys in a chat room. This is a professor of psychology at Stanford University. It's um, some of the people that worked on the Mars rover, NASA, Boeing, SpaceX. And it's organized like a normal company. We even have several very large companies as part of our team. Ehrlichon Leibold, they're the inventor of the vacuum pump. They're part of our team working in exchange for stock options. AECOM is the largest construction engineering firm in the world. We have AR companies and many other technology providers that are part of our team, sponsorships. So this works. In total, we had more than $18 million worth of man hours that have gone into the project. So even so we didn't raise any money, which by the way was a choice, there's plenty of value that has gone in. On average, right now, we get five new applications a day. In fact, I think one of the things that's not working that great right now is how we get all the people involved. Because when you have 500 people, it starts getting really difficult to manage everybody. So we're working on getting even more people on. So as I said, it was a choice. We had more than 600 accredited investors and institutional investors that have come up to us and wanted to invest into the company. But when we started, we didn't know if this was possible. So we didn't want it to just raise money to, uh, you know, to see if this could even be done. We didn't need it. We had all the people. We had sponsorships for our tools. We could figure out if this could be done. Now that we are building, it's a different thing. We got more than $12 million al uh, alone in right of way. Because remember, in Quay Valley, we have ground right next to the freeway. So this is all great, but uh, when are we actually going to see the Hyperloop? Well, we filed our building permits a month ago in Quay Valley, Kings County, California. Started the mapping and the surveying process on the ground and um, start to break ground in around five to six months. So by 2018, end of 2018, 2019, you will see the first passenger Hyperloop in Kings County, California. Even so we do this right now in the US, it's actually really, really difficult to get something like this going in the United States or even in Europe. So we have around 20 city pairs all around the world that are interested in having one of the first hyperloops. But most of these are going to be in Asia, Indonesia, Middle East, Africa. Because remember the picture of Beijing? They have problems right now that they have to solve. If you want to do something like this in Europe or in America, unfortunately, it's going to take you 30 years, 20. So you'll hear a lot of updates very, very soon. We're actually in the process of closing the first couple of contracts over the next couple of months. So. I think it's important, the message that I like to get over is that every company should be a movement, that you can do things without a lot of funds, because a lot of times it's not the money that you have to raise, but it's um, knowledge, the specialty that you're looking for. You're looking for the programmer to hire. Well, how about getting him on board? So, you know, and it, nevertheless, at the end, obviously, we would love to hear all your input and your feedback, and um, would love to have you join us. Thank you.